I would like to talk about uh, limits. <clears throat> and uh, we have chosen to discuss limits of sequences first. So let's see what a sequence is. A sequence is by definition, a function whose domain of definition is the set of natural numbers. So a sequence is a function defined on the set of natural numbers that's the set consisting of the numbers one two three and so on so usually instead of writing a of n we actually use the notation a sub n so for example we could write a sub n is n over n squared plus one that would be an example of a sequence and that means that we would have a1 is 1 over 1 squared plus 1 which is 2 a2 is equal to 2 over 2 squared plus 1 which is 5 a3 which is 3 over 3 squared plus 1 which is 10 a4 which is 4 over uh, four squared plus one, which is 17, and so on. So the nice thing in some sense is that we can write the inputs and outputs of the sequence one after the other. And I could have equally written just the terms, one half, two fifths, three over 10, four over 17, and so on. And it is true that one could give a sequence by giving the first few terms without any need to give um, the formula. So that, for example, here would have been the formula of the sequence. But let's say for the sake of the argument, I told you that I have a sequence whose terms are one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, and so on. <clears throat> and the question is just by saying, and so on, can one understand what uh, the remaining terms are going to be? Uh, uh, there are infinitely many remaining terms, but if we can understand how to find, how to find them, it's pretty much the same thing. And here you can notice that, um, if you add any two terms, consecutive terms of this sequence, then you get the next one. And so you see that two is obtained by adding one plus one. Uh, three is obtained by adding one plus two. Five is obtained by adding two plus three. Uh, this is actually a very famous sequence. It has a formula that one can find, but it's not such a simple formula. It's called the Fibonacci sequence. And in some sense, through um, this example, one can see that it's sometimes very easy to uh, give a sequence by just listing numbers one after the other and implying that they are the outputs of the obvious inputs, meaning this would have been a1, this would have been a2, this would have been a3, this would have been a4, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that in, in this sense, there is a definitely a difference between sequences and general functions. And also the, the nice thing about the sequence is that it gives us a sort of uh, dynamic notion it's really the uh, question that one could ask of what happens to the terms of the sequence as we keep going. So to give you an example, if I wrote down the sequence uh, one, one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, and so on, you can guess 
what the rest of the terms are. Then you can easily see that this sequence seems to, or the terms of the sequence for that matter, seem to be approaching zero. By the same token, if I wrote down the sequence um, two over one, three over two, four over three, five over four, six over five, seven over six, eight over seven, and so on and so forth, then one again could get the um, idea that terms of the sequence approach one. So here we could say that the terms of the sequence approach zero. And here you could say that the terms of this sequence approach one. And in both cases, it's a rather intuitive matter of understanding that uh, the terms of the sequence seem to be pointing toward uh, the corresponding number. Uh, we would like to have a much more uh, rigorous approach to what uh, it means for the terms of a sequence to approach number. In fact, we're going to call this, we're going to say that uh, the sequence has a limit. And today we're going to be interested in specifically the case where the limit is a real number. So without any further um, explanation, let's just give the uh, definition of the limit of a sequence. So we will say that the sequence a n approaches l as n approaches infinity if for any epsilon greater than zero the inequality A n minus L is less than epsilon holds for all large enough natural numbers. It is true that we have tweaked the classical definition in order to um, lighten up the notation a little. But the, the main idea is that no matter what numerical challenge one could give as to how close the terms of the sequence come to the number L, one could meet that challenge, meaning one could show that eventually the terms of the sequence are within any small amount of the number L. Uh, one has to note this here that historically this definition was not something straightforward. It took people a while to come up with definitions of with a definition like this, and in general with definitions of this kind. And this was approached by the this was uh, accomplished by the French school of mathematics, in particular by um, Cauchy and his contemporaries, who were able to pretty much uh, take away a certain vagueness that existed around limits. And one might argue that this way they inaugurated 
the modern era of mathematical analysis. So the question is, uh, how do we actually use this definition? So for example, we, we said a moment ago that uh, the sequence um, one, one half, one third, and so on. So that would be the sequence one over n has limit zero. How would we verify this by using this definition? So not that the definition alludes to every small number epsilon greater than zero. And that seems to be a nightmare of a situation because it seems that one would have to consider all uh, small numbers. Uh, that means infinitely many tasks to accomplish. The simple strategy that one develops is to just fix one of these small numbers without revealing it and show that it is possible for to it is possible to accomplish the task for that number. Once the task has been accomplished for that number, then since the number is random, is could be any number, it's as if we have verified the definition for uh, all numbers. So we start by saying uh, we fix epsilon greater than zero. We wish to show that the inequality one over n minus zero less than epsilon is true for large enough n. Indeed, now what we're going to do is rewrite that inequality essentially solved for n and making sure that uh, it's true for n large enough. So this can be rewritten. This is the if and only if sign, uh, one over n. You can drop the zero and then also the absolute value is less than epsilon. And this is equivalent to n being greater than one over epsilon. So you can see that this inequality is true for any n large, larger than one over epsilon, meaning any large enough natural number. And that's all we need to do. This is a very, very simple case. And we will see that we will just have to deal with slightly more complicated cases, which however will be uh, quite straightforward to handle as long as we can uh, algebraically isolate n. So let's look at another example. So let's show the second statement that we just mentioned. So let's show that the limit as n tends to infinity of n plus one over n is equal to one. Yeah. So how do we do this? Again, it's the same story. So we fix epsilon greater than zero. We wish to uh, show that the inequality, these are things that we should write with uh, each of these problems. n plus one over n minus the alleged limit, which is one being less than epsilon is true for large, enough n. Indeed, n plus one over n minus one less than epsilon is equivalent to n plus one over n minus n over n. So we clear denominators less than epsilon. And this is one over n less than epsilon, 
which is one over n being less than epsilon and is equivalent to n being greater than one over epsilon. And again, by just a little more algebra, we were able to show that the um, initial inequality, that the inequality that we had was true for large enough n. Let's look at one more example. Let's make it a little more generic this time. Show that. Uh, in fact, let's say how in general we would uh, so use the definition of limit. That would be the complete statement. So use the definition of limit. In order to show that the limit as n tends to infinity of 2n plus 1 over 3n plus 2 is equal to 2 thirds. Okay, so how would we do this? Again, we start by fixing an epsilon greater than zero. So we fix epsilon greater than zero. We want to show that the inequality two n plus one over three n plus two minus two thirds being less than epsilon is true for large enough n. Uh, indeed, so we will see that it's it's not necessarily much more difficult. It's a little more um, algebraically interest to, interesting to, to show this. So, so we start with our difference. And then we clear denominators. So we multiply the first fraction above and below by the denominator of the other fraction. Same thing for the second fraction. And now we put everything under a common denominator and also distribute the two parentheses. So what are we going to get? We will get so the common denominator is going to be 3n plus 2 times 3. And we will get uh, 6n plus 3 minus 6n minus positive uh, 4, so minus 4. less than epsilon. So this cancels with that. And we get negative one over, and let's multiply out, out the denominator. So this will be nine N plus six less than epsilon. It's clear what the absolute value of this quantity is. All we need to do is get rid of the negative uh, sign in front of one. So it's going to be one over 9n plus 6 less than epsilon. And we invert both fractions and the direction of the inequality changes. And now we isolate uh, n. So we have 9n 
is greater than one over epsilon minus six, which is the same thing as n being greater than one over nine. So we multiply both sides by one over nine, one over epsilon minus six. And that's all. We have shown, in other words, that the initial inequality that we wanted to establish, showing that the sequence minus the alleged limit is less than any specific number that we could choose, is equivalent to a natural number being large enough, which is exactly what uh, we were supposed. Okay. And that's all. Thanks for watching.